Hey, this is Dr. Cornelius. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about anesthesia for endocrine surgery. You've already gotten the introduction to the endocrine system, and we're going to go over some specific uh, concerns that we have to worry about in the uh, anesthesia world as far as the endocrine system. Uh, one of the most common things we deal with is the uh, thyroid. Uh, generally it weighs about 20 grams. It has two lobes and an isthmus, and it's attached to the lateral aspects of the trachea, which is kind of where it gets to be problematic, because as you can see from this image, we deal with a lot of blood supply there. You also have a pretty significant nervous supply you have to worry about there. And this is one of those really common test questions you're going to see asking about which nerve is affected and what nerve does this. Um, you know, if you can't remember anything, I would probably remember the uh, internal laryngeal branch and the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve. Um, those are the two ones that you're most commonly gonna see as you go through things. Um, when you look at the thyroid itself, there's a couple things you have to think about. Uh, you have calcitonin, which is uh, released in response to increased calcium, and it works by inhibiting the activity in the bones. So it inhibits the renal tubular cell absorption of the calcium. Um, these effects are minimal and generally have a little effect on the calcium concentration. But where you see it become problematic is when you no longer have a thyroid. When you look at how thyroid hormone is secreted, you have to have iodine, which results in normal amounts of thyroid. And the iodine generally comes from our GI tract. So if you have a dietary imbalance, you may have issues. So you adjust the iodine, it's reduced to iodide in the GI tract, then it's absorbed into the blood and eventually makes its way over to the thyroid. So when we start talking about the effects of the thyroid, it does a couple of things. And when we start looking at symptoms, these are where they oftentimes become problematic. So you, it generates heats, it stimulates ATP formation in the mitochondria, influences the flux of ions, and it stimulates metabolic processes, your basal metabolic rate, protein synthesis, and then regulation of uh, protein, fat, and carb metabolism. You have some cardiac effects of the thyroid, which are one of the things we really worry about. Uh, big one, you have increased left ventricular contractility, increased left ventricular ejection traction, uh, tachycardia, increased systolic blood pressure and decreased diastolic blood pressure, uh, heart failure and dysrhythmias. Going back to the innervation there, um, you have two different uh, systems. Your parasympathetic obviously comes from the vagus nerve and your sympathetic fibers are primarily along the blood vessels and they come from the superior, middle and inferior ganglia of the sympathetic trunk. So one thing for you to really take away from that is how close that is to the core and the significant effects you can have on your body systems. As far as the vascular supply, uh, you have the superior thyroid artery, which is a branch of the external carotid. So when you start looking at these cases, you have to worry a lot about bleeding. Um, I had a patient a couple of weeks ago that wound up with an expanding hematoma after surgery, several hours after surgery. Um, so things can look really good at the end of the case and then become problematic. Uh, you also have the inferior thyroid artery, which is a branch of the subclavian. And then the uh, IMA runs through there as well off of the aortic arch. So extremely vascular and extremely close to big vessels. So when you start taking these surgeries lightly, it can become problematic for you. So even though it's just a thyroid, you have significant potential for blood loss. On the venous side, uh, it's primarily going to be draining into the internal jugular, which again is very close to the uh, thyroid, and then the brachiocephalic trunk. So how do we diagnose thyroid disease? Um, one of the biggest things and most specific things is your TSH. Normal value is 0.4 to 5 milliunits per liter. Um, when we start talking about hyperthyroidism, you're gonna have an elevated T3, elevated T4, and your TSH is gonna be normal. Hypothyroidism, everything's gonna be decreased. I don't expect you to remember all these values. Generally, just remember that with hyperthyroidism, your values are gonna be elevated hypothyroidism, your values are going to be decreased. And then if you remember what the normal values are, you should be fine. So we're starting to see a significant increase in the rate of thyroid cancer. Um, if you look at some of these numbers from 2009 to 2016, it almost doubled. Um, it's generally going to be papillary cancer. And they're primarily small tumors, which is good for us. Um, because you, one of the other things you have to worry about with these patients, if you have large thyroid masses, you can have airway difficulties. So generally with this population, it's going to be small tumors that don't result in airway issues, but there's always a potential for it, especially if it's not addressed early on. Just a graph showing you kind of what we're looking at here. 
Um, the nice thing is due to early detection and treatment, we haven't seen a whole lot of increase in the mortality rate. The other side of that is that we're seeing possibly an increased and in overdiagnosis of thyroid cancer. And it seems to be somewhat country specific. Um, we haven't really seen it so much in the United States, but a lot of the European countries uh, are having a pretty significant overdiagnosis as well as some of the Asian countries. So it's something for you to think about. And one of the things you really need to consider when you're looking at these patients is evaluating the whole picture. So don't just get focused on the diagnosis the surgeon has given you, especially if you're worried about airway concerns. Um, we're gonna look at some slides here in just a second as you kind of look at an airway mass and how it can be a potential problem to you. So when you start evaluating these patients, don't accept that all the thyroid cancers are the same. Stop and look at the patient themselves. And this just kind of shows you they had this increased incidence and increased uh, diagnosis, but their mortality didn't actually increase at all. The other thing we have to worry about is kind of silent thyroid cancer, which is pretty common. Uh, a lot of patients on autopsy are found to have uh, papillary cancer, and it may be metastatic or it may just be non-diagnosed because the masses are so small. So we're going to look real quick at an uh, ultrasound evaluation of the neck. Grammarly does more than catch errors. With Grammarly, you can find really good, no, perfect words that make your writing sh Hello and welcome to the University of Florida ultrasound module for the medical school. This is the neck ultrasound. It's module number five, but it will be module number one for the first year class. You're going to learn how to evaluate the anatomical structures in the neck, mainly the thyroid gland and the vessels that are lying next to the gland, and you will be able to see changes in the caliber of those vessels with pressure changes. So you will learn from anatomy that the thyroid gland is located in the inferior aspect of the neck, anterior to the trachea. It mainly has three lobes, right, left, connected by the isthmus, and the carotid, common carotid vessels, along with the internal jugular, lie lateral to the lobes. Here we see an anatomical drawing of the thyroid line inside of there and another broader picture of a head and neck dissection, clearly identifying the thyroid gland. We are gonna be scanning with the vascular probe. It's a high frequency probe, and it gives us great images. We're gonna make sure we are in between the thyroid cartilage and the sternal notch. That's the area where the thyroid uh, is located. And we're gonna have the indicator probe pointed towards the right of the patient. And this is the transverse view we're gonna see where the trachea is there in the middle of the screen and anterior to the trachea, you're gonna have the thyroid. You're gonna have the right lobe and the left lobe connected by the isthmus. And then this is a moving image of that transverse view. You're gonna be able to see the trachea again. You're gonna see the right lobe of the thyroid and you're also gonna see the common carotid artery. If you move the transducer laterally, you're also gonna be able to visualize the internal jugular vein. The internal jugular lies lateral and anterior to the carotid artery. Now let's move the probe laterally so we can see all the structures. So in one image, we should be able to visualize the trachea in the midline, and as we move Laterally, you'll see the right lobe of the thyroid along with the common carotid and then the internal jugular in the most lateral part of the image. In the anterior portion of your image, you're gonna see the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Here's the moving image of the ultrasound. You see the pulsations of the common carotid. So now, we're gonna be able to compress the vessels as we apply pressure with our probe. And what happens is that the internal jugular collapses when we apply the pressure and the more uh, round common carotid, you can see that it doesn't collapse. Well, you know, that's because first of all, there's difference anatomical histological differences between the two vessels with the uh, arteries having greater collagen deposition and stronger layers, you'll see that in histology.
but you're able uh, in a way with the ultrasound to visualize those differences. Another concept we can visualize with the ultrasound is a concept of the Valsalva. Uh, so Valsalva maneuver is named by an Italian uh, ear, nose and throat doctor, Antonio Valsalva, those Italian guys were naming everything. So basically it's a, it's a maneuver when uh, there is a forced exhalation against a closed airway. So it's kind of when you're kind of bearing down, you know, and you're putting pressure. So there, there's several uh, phases of the Valsalva, but basically there's a initial pressure uh, that rises in the chest when you perform the maneuver. And uh, all those uh, pressure changes that you will talk about in physiology uh, basically have a decreased return to the systemic circulation towards the heart. So if you think about it, the jugular vein brings a venous return basically from the brain and from the facial veins. Um, so if you if you're, have decreased blood flow to the heart, can't, you're backing up. So you're gonna see a dilatation of that internal jugular vein. Uh, veins dilate, they have a higher compliance. That's another concept you'll probably talk about in physiology. And you are also able to visualize that with the ultrasound. So we've talked about basic thyroid anatomy and some of the vessels that uh, lie next to the thyroid. You should be able to definitely identify those vessels uh, and long as the thyroid structures, right lobe, left lobe, the nismus. And you should be able to see the changes in the internal jugular with the Balsalva maneuver. So that's all for now. We will see you guys in the lab. Thank you. People ask me every day, what do I do to look the way that I do? All right, so that kind of gives you an overview of the anatomy. And through our use of ultrasound, we've seen a lot more emphasis being placed on ultrasound evaluation of structures, primarily for nerve blocks and vascular access. But all of those things sit very close proximity to the thyroid and the structures in the neck. So it's good to be very familiar with it. So talking about thyroid tumors, um, one of the things that comes to mind is that a lot of them might need to be left alone. Again, this is not testable material, but we are seeing some peaks. Um, and one of the things I thought was kind of interesting in this is you look at the Asian countries, uh, and perhaps that's part of the reason they have an increase is uh, exposure to environmental factors, radiation, uh, that sort of thing. Nothing to back that up, just a thought as it's going through there. Um, it's a pretty significant impact outside of the medical diagnosis. Um, cancer patients are about two and a half times as likely to uh, declare bankruptcy. Um, and primarily thyroid cancer patients have the highest risk, which is interesting since it's such an easily treatable disease. So let's look at their prognosis. Um, big factors, the age of the patient. Uh, as you get older, it's a little more uh, difficult. Females generally are more prominent. Uh, metastasis is obviously, uh, obviously problematic. Large tumors are difficult. Uh, local invasion is generally a little bit easier to treat. Uh, the mainstay of surgical treatment for thyroid cancer. Um, over the last 20 years or so, we've become more aggressive with it. Before that, we used to take biopsies and we'd kind of take a look and see how things were growing. Uh, then in the meantime, we kind of transitioned into taking them out as soon as it's detected. And now as some of this data has been presented, we've kind of went back towards uh, less aggressive surgery, uh, following them, ultrasound evaluation, biopsies, that sorts of thing. So as far as your, uh, the surgical options go, you can have a lobectomy. If only one side's affected, you may just remove a left or a right. Um, that's better for the patient because they're now not euthyroid. Um, they may still require some supplementation. Patients with a significant disease generally have to have total thyroidectomy. And then if you've had invasion or metastasis, they may have to remove the uh, left nodes as well, which uh, obviously is a more substantial surgery as you start getting into big neck dissections. So surgical risk, as I mentioned earlier, one of the biggest things we worry about is the recurrent laryngeal nerve injury. Um, generally, if it's unilateral, they may have some hoarseness, a little bit of globus sensation. It very rarely causes airway issues. One thing you may see sometimes is the surgeon wanting to actually see the vocal cords move at the end of the case, um, which can be a little bit difficult from our respect because it's not uncommon to have some swelling and edema as they've kind of worked around the trachea for hours on end. You may have a little soft tissue edema, um, so it may be hard. They can also have the patient talk. And then one of the other big risks is hypoparathyroidism. 
Um, it's permanent in a low percentage of the population, um, but it's often very uh, temporary. Hyperthyroidism is caused by an excessive secretion of thyroid hormone when there's an overactive thyroid gland. Uh, the most common cause being Graves' disease, which is a diffuse enlargement of the gland. And this is where we start to worry about goiters. Uh, you may have thyroid adenomas, carcinomas, adenomas of the pituitary gland, or it could be iatrogenic. Something's been done to stimulate it itself. Um, the biggest manifestation is going to be uh, thyrotoxicosis, which is uh, basically a result of the excess uh, level of thyroid hormone. Uh, symptoms. Nervousness, sweating, remember the uh, temperature regulation issues. They may not tolerate heat very well. They may have tachycardia, either real or perceived. You may see them get uh, tired rather easily. Uh, friends I've seen that had unknown thyroid diagnosis, the biggest thing they had was weight loss. And they were happy to see that it wasn't a big cancer, but at the same time, um, you know, obviously they had a disease process going on. Because of the increased metabolism, you see a lot of increase in appetite. And uh, you may have, going along those same lines, increased in GI motility and defecation. Uh, signs, the thyroid becomes large, they become tachycardic. Atrial fibrillation or uh, other tachycardia arrhythmias are not uncommon. PSVT is another one. Um, they may have systolic hypertension and you see a widening pulse pressure. And one of the big obvious things we see is the uh, eye symptoms, the exophthalmos. Um, when we start talking about this, it's generally females more than males. Age is primarily 20 to 40. Uh, a lot of times we don't know what causes it, but the thyroid will, for some reason, become two to three times as productive as it should usually be. Treatment generally involves steroids, radiation, and finally surgery. Um, this is just a chart showing you as you start to see those increased values, kind of what symptoms are associated with that. So treatment, uh, antithyroid drugs, beta blockers, glucocorticoids, radioactive iodine, and surgery. Uh, as far as the medications go, one of the biggest ones you're going to see is uh, PTU, methamazole, and carbamazole. And what they do is inhibit the uh, synthesis of thyroid hormone by blocking the action of the perioxidase enzyme. Um, it also inhibits the peripheral conversion of T4 to T3. Um, you will also see that potassium or sodium iodide prevents the release of thyroid hormone into the tissue, so it kind of stays bottled up there. Um, we start these patients on beta blockers. Generally, it's going to be for pranolol, um, and it blocks the uh, high beta adrenergic response from the catecholamines, reducing their pulse rate, their blood pressure. Um, glucocorticoids are given a lot of times to decrease the uh, release of the hormone. It also inhibits the conversion of T4 to T3. Radioactive iodine may be used because it destroys the follicular cells. Um, generally, about 80% uh, will go into remission, and 40 to 70% you'll see will be hypothyroidism within uh, 10 years. Surgery, uh, generally, as far as the remission rate, it's about 95%, and 10 to 30% will be uh, hypothyroid within 20 years. So big indications for surgery, uh, large goiters, compressive symptoms, uh, children and young adults, so people with long lifespans, a lot of times we have to do a risk-benefit analysis, and if you have an old or a frail patient, they may do poorly with such major surgery, so you may be better off just letting it go. The uh, risk from the surgery may outweigh those for the uh, disease process itself. Uh, suspicious nodules are uh, confirmed by biopsy uh, cancer. A lot of times they'll proceed to surgery. If they're allergic to any of the antithyroid drugs, that kind of limits your treatment. Uh, patients that are pregnant or desire to conceive soon, a lot of times we'll try and take care of thyroid issues before we add factors to it. Um, if you have moderate or severe ophthalmologic symptoms or uh, cosmetic desires to the patients, we may also move to surgery to try and address those concerns. So from an anesthesia standpoint, uh, preoperatively, we want to evaluate the upper airway and the tracheal deviation. Like I said, we're going to look at some CT stuff here in just a minute to kind of make us uh, think twice about things. In addition to the CT scan, you also want to get a chest x-ray. Uh, you want the patient to be euthyroid. Generally, it's going to be done with uh, antithyroid drugs and beta blockers. And a lot of times what you'll see in these patients is that they're still going to be somewhat tachycardic. Uh, generally not over 100, but you know 80s to 90s, whereas maybe their previous heart rate was uh, low. So from an anesthesia standpoint, it's generally going to be an IV induction. Um, it may be difficult intubation, especially if you have somebody that does have a large goiter. 
Um, if you have concerns, especially if they've been verified by CT, move to an awake harbor optic intubation, uh, inhalation, induction. A lot of times with those compressible tumors, we'll use an armored endotracheal tube to decrease the risk of kinking. And make sure you've got a couple sizes of endotracheal tube there, especially if you have a tumor, you may have a hard time getting the uh, calculated size into place. So you may have to use a little bit smaller tube. Uh, intraoperatively, generally a pretty safe induction and awakening. There's no reason to rush things. Um, as I mentioned, sometimes they want to evaluate the trachea. So you may have to take a look after you've pulled the endotracheal tube out, anticipate that either by getting the patient deep or keeping a little bit of propofol around for them to take a look. Um, you want to try and maintain an adequate level of anesthesia throughout uh, because you know they're already prone to sympathetic response, especially with the surgical stimulus. So a lot of times what we use for that, atomidate, uh, propofol, and some barbiturates for induction. We uh, will use ashcurium or vecuronium for muscle relaxation. Uh, Rocuronium is also acceptable. And generally, for, as far as the inhalational agents, we use isoflurane. Things you want to try and avoid, uh, anything that's going to cause hypertension or tachycardia. So atropine, pancuronium, halothane, ketamine. Um, while you want to make sure you're aggressively treating periods of hypotension, especially if they've auto-regulated to a higher value, you want to make sure you don't overshoot. Uh, you run into kind of some weird positioning. It's not uncommon for them to hyperextend the neck, so they'll put an IV bag back behind the shoulders. Make sure the eyes are protected since they're so close to the surgical field. Be very careful with the positioning of the shoulders to avoid any injuries to the brachial plexus. A lot of times the surgeon will transition from one side of the patient to the other as they remove one lobe and then the next. Uh, if you have a hyperthyroid patient that uh, requires emergent surgery and they've had no optimization, it's not uncommon to run them on an Esmolol drip during the surgery and try to avoid whatever sympathetic stimulations you can during that time. Postoperatively, what we worry about is an acute exacerbation of hyperthyroidism due to an excessive release of the thyroid hormone. Uh, onset is generally intraoperatively or very quickly after surgery, six to 24 hours. Uh, signs and symptoms, hyperpyrexia, tachycardia, AFib, hypotension due to the tachycardia, or, or the associated volume loss, they may have vomiting. Uh, they may be breathing too fast. There may be some abdominal pain, uh, almost presenting like an acute abdomen. They may be psychotic, agitated. Uh, the diagnosis is primarily gonna be clinical, uh, but the problems you run into, especially intraoperatively when you can't really evaluate the patient, uh, could be potentially malignant hypothermia, an undiagnosed pheochromocytona, or uh, light anesthesia. So do what you can to kind of investigate things. If they've had a systemic steroid, certainly look at that. Simultaneously, you want to be making sure you're uh, providing receptor blockade with uh, Esmolol, Propranolol. Look at cardiac failure, especially if you had an older patient or maybe somebody that was already tedious, because you want to try and address potential dehydration, make sure they get cool, but at the same time, you want to avoid fluid overloading them if you can. So you kind of have a triad of concerns here. Uh, the biggest one is airway. If you look at the uh, CT image there on the left, the arrows are pointing out the large tumor that's displaced your trachea. That's problematic. Uh, other issues you run into, um, maybe not necessarily as a result of a tumor, they could have a neck hematoma compressing the trachea. You could have some tracheomalacia. Uh, these patients, especially if they have inadequate reversal of the uh, neuromuscular relaxants, can have issues as also with uh, CNS depression as a result of the generally opioids given during the surgery. It's not uncommon to see tetany in these patients. Usually it's gonna present through a laryngeal spasm, uh, either trousseau or chostex signs, or you may have some paresthesias as well. Uh, could result from a respiratory al alkalosis as a result of overventilation. Um, for these patients, generally you're gonna treat it with uh, calcium replacement, uh, either gluconate or chloride, depending on the degree of symptoms and availability. Other things you have to worry about, recurrent laryngeal nerve injury. Uh, if you see on the center image there at the uh, left vocal cord, remember we're looking from the other direction, is uh, paralyzed, so it's not responding, whereas the right is moving. And then on the other image, you're seeing the exact opposite. So if it's unilateral, a lot of times it's asymptomatic unless you actually look at the cords moving. But what you may see is kind of inadequate airway clearance. They may choke a little bit and cough, especially if they're drinking. Bilateral is going to be almost an immediate thing, and it's going to present right after extubation. You're going to hear a strider, respiratory distress. They're not going to be able to talk, and they're going to quickly desaturate. Uh, in that case, you're going to reintubate and observe them, uh, see if it's able to return. 
make sure at that point you've achieved full uh, reversal of any neuromuscular blockers. A lot of times for these cases, you're not going to use uh, long-term agents. You're probably just going to use succinicolin for most of these patients. So you don't have to worry about that. But if for some reason you do, you need to make sure they've had full return of uh, neurovascular function. You don't have any uh, pseudocolon esterase deficiencies that, or any of those other problem areas. So if it doesn't return, they're going to inject some Teflon. And then at that point, the uh, damage may be semi-permanent. They'll look to speech therapy and see what they can do about uh, re-innervation. If there's really nothing done at that point, it's kind of a window out to about six months there um, where they can start doing some other stuff, but it doesn't happen very quickly. Um, other things that may be beneficial, steroids. Um, and if you're unable to extubate the patient due to ongoing problems, they're going to require a tracheostomy. Hypoparathyroidism um, is a condition when the body tissues are exposed to decreased levels of thyroid hormones, primarily caused by destruction of the thyroid gland, either surgical or disease process, uh, radiation therapy, uh, Hashimoto's thyroid thyroiditis is another common concern. Um, other things, antithyroid drugs, excessive iodine, or a dietary iodine deficiency. And then you can also have it as a secondary disease process, generally because of CNS defunction. Um, and one of the biggest things you're gonna see is like pituitary tumors have caused it. Um, and you may see weird levels with your uh, TSH. It may be high, it may be low, um, just depending on exactly where it's coming from. Uh, so a lot of times for these patients, they're gonna get calcitrol. And what we're doing there is, uh, especially if this is post uh, thyroidectomy, you're trying to prevent the hypocalcemia that a lot of times will follow it. And one of the things they will monitor is the parathyroid hormone post uh, operatively, because you'll see that low PTH also predicts hypocalcemia. Signs and symptoms in these patients, uh, cold intolerance, remember with uh, thyroid stuff, that it was a uh, heat intolerance. They may be lethargic. Uh, you may have a decreased circulating uh, cardiac output. Uh, up to 40%. You may have long CERT times and very narrow pulse pressures. And uh, the, you may have increased peripheral vascular resistance to decrease the heat loss. Uh, you may have slow onset if they uh, have severe hypothyroidism, you may need to consider doing slow inductions. Um, and generally in older patients, it'll be a little bit of a slower onset. Um, younger patients, it's a little quicker. Uh, and it's primarily gonna be treated with uh, levothyroxine uh, 75 to 100 micrograms per day. From an anesthetic standpoint, things we think about, uh, you want to hold off on elective surgeries if it's poorly controlled due to the high risk of cardiovascular complications. Um, but there are no controlled studies that really justify the sensitivity of these patients to inhaled anesthetics or opioids. Um, we just generally try not to take patients with uncontrolled disease states to the operating room. Um, other things you'll see in these patients, uh, myxedema, which is a uh, severe form of hypothyroidism characterized by a stupor, coma, hypoventilation, hypotension, hypothermia, and hypernatremia. Uh, and you may even hear it referred to as mixed edema coma uh, because they do have such a significant alteration in mental status. And the mortality rate is very high. It's generally going to be about 25 to 50%. So in these patients, we uh, prefer uh, ketamine or something with some sympathetic stimulation. Uh, if you don't have severe cardiovascular depression, you can consider propofol. Um, one thing you need to keep in mind for these patients is that there may be coexisting skeletal muscle relax, uh, weakness. So as you're using different uh, agents, you may want to avoid something that's going to be a long-term agent. Uh, for a lot of these cases, we prefer regional anesthesia, and uh, you may want to consider decreasing the, the uh, local anesthetic dose for the uh, peripheral nerve blocks. Uh, as I said, if it's elective, you shouldn't be doing it uh, if they have uh, severe hypothyroidism or coma, and you want to make sure it's treated prior to emergency surgery. As far as uh, treatment, if it is urgent, uh, make sure they get some uh, levothyroxine, 2 to 300 micrograms, generally over about 10 minutes, and then they're also going to bolus them uh, daily. Hydrocortisone, about 100 milligrams, and then you may need to repeat it a couple of times a day to prevent uh, adrenal gland suppression. Uh, supplement with fluids and electrolytes, avoid hypothermia because you know they're already cold. Um, so you want to try and do everything you can to keep them warm, especially if you're worried about the cardiovascular side effects of it. Uh, a lot of times they will fail to respond to hypoxia by increasing minute ventilation. Uh, 
So you may have to uh, look at other ventilatory strategies. They're probably going to have decreased gastric emptying, so make sure you've uh, pre-medicated them. And I, I would consider performing a rapid sequence induction on almost all these patients. Um, and then as far as maintenance, uh, standard stuff is generally okay. As I said, make sure you keep them warm. If you do have pancuronium available, it's a good choice for muscle relaxant just because of the uh, cardiovascular stimulation you see in these patients. Um, there's really nothing special about reversal. You may see prolonged emergence, uh, prolonged emergence in these patients due to hypothermia, uh, respiratory depression, and kind of the slow biotransformation. And as part of that, a lot of times they wind up staying in PACU longer. Um, so don't be surprised if you have issues with that. So next we're going to talk a little bit about anesthesia management and patients with goiters. And this is kind of one of those nightmare scenarios, especially if you're not aware of it ahead of time. Um, so we talked about thyroid nodules causing airway symptoms. Nodule size generally doesn't correlate real well with symptoms. You'll have people with these huge thyroid goiters that have been that way their whole life. Um, and a lot of times what you see is it's kind of a slow onset, so they've been able to compensate for it. But what we worry about is the tracheal deviation and tracheal compression. So this is just a quick case study I put out there for you. 72-year-old female, five-year history of uh, goiter. Um, they've been observing it. Um, she's 72. She's got a little bit of heart disease. She came out to an outside hospital because of difficulty breathing. They're like, well, this looks bad. Put her on a helicopter and flew her into your center. Uh, she gets there and she's striderous, as you would expect with this large mass, but she's not in any acute distress. So if you have this patient present to you in this situation, don't make matters worse. There's no reason to rush, in, rush into a bad airway. Stop and evaluate everything as best you can. And that's what we did in this situation. So this is the CT scan of the neck, and I'm gonna proceed through a couple images here. You can see how you've got some compression there um, from the mess. So we keep moving. Uh, the big black thing in the middle there is your trachea. That's very important for you to follow. Because one of the things we worry about in these patients, they're usually lying supine for a CT. So if they lay supine and it includes their airway, it's not a good sign for us, especially if we're considering laying them supine to put them to sleep. Uh, you may need to consider doing an awake upright intubation um, to make sure that the airway doesn't occlude during your induction. So we're progressing down through here and you can see that the uh, trachea itself is getting far more narrowed and tortuous. The uh, thyroid goiter is larger and larger. Um, now you've got some more deviation there and it continues down through there. And this is when we start really worrying about the images. You have a very small tracheal lumen that remains because of that. Um, so this is when a lot of times I'm going to actually measure the CT scan and see if this is something that I could actually get an endotracheal tube through. Because of the uh, nature of these patients, a lot of time they've had radiation, the temperature or the uh, tissue itself is very vascular. So you may have to worry about it being friable. Um, you may not be able to force an endotracheal tube into it. And then this is kind of that same image and you can see that it's a half centimeter opening, which is really worrisome. And we follow it down and it stays that same size for a little bit. Um, so we just have that one area of uh, profound narrowing to worry about. But the other thing to take note here, and the patient's a little bit rotated, but you also have the trachea deviated somewhat, which is problematic for us. Um, this image kind of brings things to life a little bit better as you go down. You can really appreciate how large that goiter is and how problematic. And here's a side view again showing you where the uh, trachea lumen is very obstructed. So what happened? Uh, awake fiber optic intubation was attempted. Uh, it failed because you couldn't really turn the corner into the trachea. Uh, attempted to try and do DL without success. Um, and then finally, we were able to do a fiber optic nasotracheal intubation. My personal experience has been a lot of times if you're doing awake intubation that uh, going the nasal route is less stimulating for the patient. And because you've already made that curvature before you get down to the airway, it's a little bit easier. Um, from our standpoint, especially if you're kind of a novice using a fiber optic scope, it can be problematic for you um, because you tend to get lost in the turbines. Uh, again, they can be friable, so you can have bleeding there, uh, and that can be problematic for you as well. So one thing I encourage for you out in residency, take as many opportunities as you can to try and get into those patients, do what you can. That patient did well, they were able to remove the goiter and it was, she was discharged on day one. So this is a study, that, a large study as far as uh, patients looking at uh, patients that have goiters. Um, 4,600 patients in the study, 
uh, almost a thousand with retrosternal retrosternal goiters, so goiters behind the sternum, which may involve uh, CV surgery, bypass, and a whole lot of other things. Um, they looked at 133 of these patients really in depth, and then uh, 32 were identified after everything else as being likely difficult intubations. Um, so 17 patients had awake fiber optic intubation, um, and usually that was done in these patients. Um, as either an inhalation induction or, a, excuse me, as an IV induction. Uh, 11 patients had inhalation induction, uh, two were converted to IV induction, so two were converted both ways. And what they found was that uh, obviously there's uh, difficult goiters that can be dealt with uh, retrosternal, um, and you can't manage these patients with conventional techniques. So things they looked at and thought about um, laryngoscopy has got to be mastered under easy conditions. So don't wait till you have those patients that really needed to try and practice this. Uh, practice on an airway mannequin, practice on easy intubations. Um, you know, have somebody that you mask down and rather than intubating, you go ahead and do a fiber optic intubation after a traditional induction. That gives you a little bit of chance to prepare yourself and practice that sort of thing. Um, Coughing, gagging, aspiration, airway irritation, and trauma are very common with awake intubations. So you want to do what you can to avoid that. Um, and awake oral tracheal intubations are extremely difficult. Um, to me, it's kind of like having awake eye surgery. I can't imagine having to look at somebody cutting on my eye for quite a while. Um, but on our approach, you know, now we're putting this big metal blade. You have physical stimulation. You have the emotional stress. There's a whole lot of factors that come into this and make it very difficult. All right, we're gonna talk a little bit about intraoperative nerve monitoring, which is pretty common in these patients. Generally what they're gonna be monitoring is the recurrent laryngeal nerve, um, and it innervates all but one of the muscles of the larynx. And if you have injury, you're gonna have uh, paralysis to the vocal cord on that side. And just a quick review for you there. Nice view of a happy looking trachea. So there's uh, several different setups there. Um, the most common, is a NIM tube, and I'll show you that in a second. This is just a different view. But whatever setup they use, you're gonna have, um, this is the NIM setup, which is probably a little more common nowadays. Um, whatever setup they use, they're essentially using your endotracheal tube as an electrode. So you'll have external leads, which are just like if you were doing uh, nerve monitoring, where they put a little uh, needle into the skin or a sticker, depending on what setup you're using. And then your endotracheal tube itself has contacts on it if you see that blue surface on the uh, picture there, that's the actual electrodes. So what you're doing is creating a circuit through the nerves. So when you place that into tracheal tube, it's extremely important that you make sure that the uh, contact electrodes are located in between the vocal cords. Uh, so you need to actually, after placement, visualize the tubes where it's supposed to be. And then if they happen to be moving the head side to side, you need to make sure that that tube is not manipulated one way or the other because you may lose contact with the electrodes. So our goal is using the intraoperative uh, monitoring, obviously preventing or early detection of nerve injury. Um, if the nerve is becoming stressed or you're operating in close proximity to it, it'll warn you. And then finally, uh, provides you with the anatomical identification of the nerve. A lot of times the tissue is very hard to tell what's what. Um, so they may use that, uh, there's a probe that they can put on the uh, NIM device that allows them to actually touch the nerve without cutting it, that uh, allows them to identify the nerve. So outcomes, it doesn't prevent injury to the recurrent nerve, but it may help confirm uh, that you are in that area. And that the other thing is that it allows you to identify that the nerve is functioning properly, or at least hopefully functioning properly before proceeding to the other side. Uh, it may allow the surgeon to improve their nerve handling, um, but there are potential false positive and false negative uh, signals that can be problematic for you. All right, pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma. Pheochromocytoma is another one of those things that kind of strikes fear into the heart of anesthesia providers. So the two things that I worry about from this lecture are those large goiters and pheochromocytomas. Um, even more concerning in this population is undetected pheochromocytoma. Or you have a patient that comes in for urgent surgery and you know somebody's done a CT scan, it looks like they have a mass on their lung, um, something to that, or excuse me, not on the lung, sitting above their kidney. Um, and those things can kind of start setting off alarm bells in your head. So generally it's gonna be a catecholamine secreting adrenal tumor. Uh, 
um, that sits right above the uh, kidney on the adrenal gland um, or any sort of strange growth there. So if you start to see things that are out of place there, you probably want to go down the path of assuming it's a theochromocytoma until you know better. And then a paraganglioma is an extra or outside the adrenal gland theochromocytoma. Uh, prevalence, it's a very small, fortunately for us, less than 0.2% of hypertensive patients. It generally peaks in about the 40th to 50th year of life. Maybe it's because at that point we're starting to have more uh, underlying issues with our blood pressure. And a large number of these patients are uh, incidental illness. Uh, since we've started doing CT scans on everybody for especially trauma or uh, other things, you know, about 10% of these will find just coincidentally. So this is what it looks like on the right side, that large white area that's almost even with the, excuse me, on the left side, that large white area that's almost even with the six to eight range is your other kidney. And then if you look on the left side or the right side of uh, the patient, is the actual uh, pheochromocytoma. So you can see how large that is. Most of them are not this large or significant, so it's not quite that easy to detect. So let's talk a little bit about the adrenal medulla. Uh, it stores catecholamine, primarily about 80% is stored as epinephrine and 20% uh, is norepinephrine. And all of those are derived from tyrosine. If you're confused, here's kind of a breakdown as how things go flowing through there from phenylalanine to tyrosine to dopa, dopamine, norepinephrine, and finally uh, epinephrine. So what do we see out of these catecholamines? Uh, increased glycogenolysis, increased gluconeogenesis, increased glucagon secretion, and decreased glucose intake. Um, they're generally cleared by urine and uh, degraded in the periphery and uptake at the nerve endings. Um, just a quick review of your alpha and beta receptors if you're struggling at this point in your program. So pheochromocytoma, the 10% tumor, um, it may be bilateral, it may be malignant, it may be multifocal, extra adrenal, uh, maybe adults, maybe uh, children. There's a large variety of these tumors that are out there. Um, so there is not really a standard approach. Generally, it's going to present with hypertension and tachycardia. Uh, from a symptom standpoint, headaches, diaphoresis, nausea, vomiting. Um, the ones that I have seen that were undetected prevented, uh, presented with profound hypertension on induction, um, like blood pressures approaching 300 over 150. Um, the, it was very obvious what was happening at that point. But then you're pushing boluses and nitroprusside trying to treat it. It can be very problematic for you. Um, a lot of these patients are going to be asymptomatic or subclinically symptomatic. That's why, you know, when you start seeing those patients that are in their 40th to 50th year of life and they start to have a little high blood pressure, it's not surprising. Um, I mentioned a lot of times it's an incidental finding on CT, and there is some sort of familiar relationship for patients uh, as far as having pheochromocytoma. Uh, confirmation may be done by biochemical testing and localization. So as far as the biochemical testing, um, we look for plasma and metanephrines, and this is going to be a 24-hour urine collection, and they're looking for the catecholamines themselves, so norepi, epi, or dopamine, or the metabolites, metanephrine, normetanephrine, or vanelli mandelic acid. Um, I think I've seen vanelli mandelic acid show up on every anesthesia test I've ever taken in my life, so I would certainly make sure I remembered that part. And you're going to expect it to be elevated in patients with a FIO. Um, if you have elevated serum epinephrine, it suggests that the uh, FIO is at the adrenal medulla or at the ergon of Zuckerlandl, which is not Zuckerberg, but um, you're gonna find the uh, phenylalanine and uh, methylating enzyme is found at those sites. So perioperatively, we wanna make sure you treat the hypertension. The preferred method is taking these patients and optimizing them beforehand, making sure they are adequately uh, alpha blockaded Make sure that adequately volume expanded so you don't have any vasoconstriction and tachycardia, which is common with their disease state. Um, and anticipate controlling cardiac arrhythmias with uh, beta blockers. So for your alpha blockade, a lot of times what we're gonna use is phenoxybenzamine. It's an alpha adrenergic antagonist. Um, usually it's gonna be initiated one to three weeks before resection. So that's why I'm saying it's so important for these patients to come in, be evaluated beforehand. And it's gonna be titrated to the point where they're almost a little bit orthostatic. Um, so blood pressure is gonna be a little bit lower on the end than they're used to. Um, downside, the medication is expensive and with our crazy medication shortages, it's become more difficult to find. Uh, 
Another medication we use is doxazosin. It's also an alpha-1 antagonist. Uh, it seems to be probably as effective as phenoxybenzamine, and it may help a little bit more intraoperatively and postoperatively. So after they're adequately blockaded, uh, you want to make sure that uh, you try and monitor their blood pressures. Because of fluid retention, they may have some increased weight. Uh, they may third space a lot of fluid so that, as I mentioned, between the medications and the volume dehydration, they may be prone to orthostatic hypotension. Um, if you're seeing tachycardia, you may need to initiate a beta blocker. Um, you never want to start off with the beta agonist, though. This is one of those weird situations because what you have is the unopposed alpha effect of the catecholamines results in vasoconstriction, hypertensive crisis, and pulmonary edema. So essentially, you're going to have them run away with their catecholamines. Interoperative monitoring, um, you want to avoid things that precipitate catecholamine secretion. So no ketamine, no pancuronium, that sort of thing. Um, least cardio uh, active agents, uh, isoflurane, influrane, nitroprusside, fentolamine. Definitely need an arterial line for these cases. They have nitroprusside infusions and pushes available. A lot of times we'll have multiple uh, antihypertensive nitroprusside, nicardipine, nitroglycerin, uh, esmol, all of those sitting there uh, ready to go. We're usually going to start off with the alpha agents and then we may move on to the beta blockers as well. Another time this becomes obvious is during pregnancy. Um, generally, if it's in the first trimester, they're going to start off with medical therapy and then let the baby get into the second trimester and then they'll initiate a resection. If it's not detected until late in pregnancy, they may do an elective C-section at term to avoid the catecholamine exacerbation with the vaginal delivery, which would precipitate hypertensive crisis. And then finally, we're going to talk a little bit about changing approaches for hyperparathyroidism. Um, so this image is kind of busy and it's hard to see things. Um, your thyroid is labeled for you up at the top, but you have these little tiny uh, hyperparathyroid uh, glands. And if you look, you notice that they're a little bit large. So this is when we start to worry about hyperparathyroid. So the pyrothyroid gland is uh, primarily composed of chief, uh, chief cells and they secrete the parathyroid hormone. Um, they have multiple granules in there that are secretatory. And they generally start off appearing at puberty, but don't do anything at that point. Um, and what you'll see in some of these patients is they may have an increase in weight. Um, so anatomy wise, it's generally like four little glands um, on the poles of the thyroid. Uh, again, you have to worry about their location relative to the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Uh, the superior glands are usually to the back of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And again, they're highly vascular coming off of the uh, carotid and draining into the IJ. So, their big thing they do is uh, produce a polypeptide hormone called parathyroid, um, which is responsible for maintaining homeostasis between calcium and phosphate and magnesium, uh, and uh, is a result of the balance between the parathyroid hormone and the calcitonin. And what they do is regulate the flow of minerals in and out of the extracellular fluid, the compartments, and the actions through the intestines, kidneys, and bones. Um, and generally, the parathyroid hormone is going to act directly on the bones and kidneys through its effect of the uh, uh, OHD23, TOH2D3. Um, and its production is uh, regulated by the concentration of serum ionized calcium. So if you see a lowering of the serum calcium levels, it's gonna increase the rate of parathyroid hormone secretion. So why is it important? Um, we know that we need it for skeletal muscle contraction, coagulation, neurotransmitter release, and then endocrine function is the other big one. Effects of it, increases activity of osteoclasts causing the release of calcium from the bone. So if you have low calcium levels, it'll increase the release of it. Um, it can also increase the calcium reabsorption from the urine to the kidney, increases your urinary phosphate excretion, um, the increased production, and you can also have an increased GI absorption of calcium. So big things to worry about with these patients, as you see here, is the risk of electrolyte shifts in these patients. So a little bit about the incidence. Uh, primary hyperparathyroidism occurs in about 21 per 100,000 patients per year. Um, the incidence is slowly going down. It generally peaks in the 50s. Um, again, females more than male. And it's the most common cause of hypercalcemia in outpatients. So if you have a patient that comes in and they seem to be profoundly hypercalcemic, um, this should be one of the first things that comes to mind. 
Other things you start to worry about in those patients are tumors that are causing some sort of uh, release of calcium from the bone. Generally about 85% of these are caused by a single adenoma. 10% um, they'll have diffuse and about 5% they'll have uh, multiple adenomas. So what you have to worry about there, and this is a picture showing you with just one adenoma. Um, when they're doing this, they will remove one parathyroid gland, check the serum level, and see if they've essentially gotten the uh, affected adenoma. Um, and then if not, they'll remove the next one. So these can be long cases with uh, you drawing intraoperative parathyroid hormone levels and checking to see where the patient stands. So signs and symptoms, um, stones, bones, groans, and moans. So you have to worry about kidney stones, uh, skeletal muscle deficiencies. They may have abdominal pain. Uh, you may have cardiovascular symptoms, and then you may also have some psychiatric and neuromuscular symptoms. Uh, as far as the neuropsychiatric stuff goes, they become fatigued very easily. They may be depressed. They may have a hard time focusing on things, remembering things, and you may see some uh, proximal myopathy. Um, for these patients, surgery is really the only cure. Uh, you can administer uh, biophosphonates that will lower the calcium, um, but they may actually increase the parathyroid hormone. Uh, Sinicolet uh, lowers the calcium, but only modestly lowers the parathyroid. So uh, the next question is, does everybody need surgery? So here we are looking at a lot of these patients and uh, you kind of have a surgery versus observation series here um, and just different lab values, what was happening with the different patients. Um, so a lot of these patients are probably gonna require surgery as I said earlier. The other thing is surgery is to indicate for patients who uh, they either don't wanna do any sort of follow-up medical surveillance or uh, they are not meeting any guidelines and there are no contraindications, but they went ahead and basically get it over with. So why does almost everyone need surgery for hyperparathyroidism? Um, when it gets to the point of end organ damage, it's irreversible. Um, the neuropsychiatric symptoms are often common and subtle, but they can be problematic for patients. Um, the operation is very effective. It's got minimal mortality or morbidity for the patients. Uh, we worry about it a lot less than we do uh, full thyroidectomies. Surgical treatment, um, as I said, they may remove one or more of the glands for adenomas. Um, if they have diffuse hypoplasia, they'll probably remove almost all of it. The gold standard is full neck exploration, visualizing all four glands. But as I mentioned, what we're starting to see is more of a directed parathyroidectomy, um, where they're actually getting preoperative imaging, doing intraoperative parathyroid monitoring, and they've done fairly well with that and not having to remove the entire thyroid, uh, parathyroid. So as far as the imaging, uh, system may be scanned, ultrasounds, uh, CTs, MRIs, and uh, overall sensitivity that there's something wrong is given about 70, 80%, but they don't do very well with uh, multi-gland disease. So you may find one and realize there are others. Um, and these are just kind of showing you some of these parathyroid glands that you have to worry about. And again, is they generally don't have the large size that you see with uh, thyroid goiters, but they can still be problematic uh, as far as airway or vessel compression. So preoperatively for these patients, uh, you wanna assess volume status to avoid hypotension during induction. Um, hydration is generally gonna be with normal saline. <coughs> Excuse me. And you may even diurese these patients uh, trying to get their serum calcium into a normal range. Lab monitoring is very important. Uh, evaluate the status of any comorbidities. And if you have somebody, especially that's a little bit older that you're worried about bones being very fragile, uh, you wanna make sure that you've done everything you can to address that, especially as far as positioning, um, patient activity, that sort of thing. Intraoperatively, uh, Routine monitors, you want to titrate your muscle relaxants because a lot of times they do have some pre-existing weakness. Um, if they have a decreased level of consciousness beforehand, consider decreasing your level of anesthetic agents. Make sure you adequately protect the eyes. Avoid hypoventilating the patient as acidosis can cause an increase in uh, ionized calcium, which can lead to dysrhythmias. You may see some tracheal manipulation during dissection. Proper patient positioning is important because, the, as I mentioned, the osteoporosis uh, predisposes the patients to uh, bony fractures, uh, especially as you start looking at vertebral injuries during airway instrumentation. Postoperatively, you want a smooth emergence to try and reduce the risk of localized tissue trauma. Again, you have concerns of 
uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve damage. So you may utilize an M-tube for this patient. Postoperatively, things you worry about, neck hematomas, uh, swelling of the larynx or the glottis, recurrent laryngeal nerve damage, hypocalcemia may lead to tetany. Uh, they may have acute arthritis. And as I touched on, uh, metabolic acidosis with deterioration of the uh, renal function. One other thing you may see is a parathyroid crisis. And with this, you're gonna have a calcium level greater than 15. These patients have to be hydrated quickly, um, which will help dilute the calcium. And then you're gonna diurese them again with a loop diuretic to try and uh, promote the calcium and fluid excretion. You may also give glucocorticoids, uh, calcitonin and dialyze the patients. So as far as the intraoperative parathyroid assay, uh, you're just trying to make sure that you've removed all the tissue without having to physically examine the glands. Um, so just a quick study here looking at the uh, reporting of the intraoperative parathyroid assay. And what you see here is uh, it's produced only in the parathyroid, so it's very specific and it's got a very short half-life, about four minutes. So when you start looking at these patients, it's very easy to determine if you've gotten the right gland quickly. Um, from our standpoint, what we're generally going to do is put in an arterial line and use that to obtain your blood samples. It'll go into a tube that uh, is usually hand carried to the lab. There are times that uh, they may have a point of care test they can bring into the room, but I haven't had any personal experience with that. So after an induction, but before they start the procedure, you're going to get a baseline sample. Um, and then as they start to uh, manipulate things, you'll probably get a second sample. And then after they remove the first gland, usually five to 10 minutes, you'll get a sample there. Um, and then you may get a repeat sample. Um, and the criteria when you look at this is about a 50% decrease in parathyroid hormone after the uh, post-excision from the baseline. Um, so if they remove one gland and don't have that significant decrease, they're gonna move on to the next most suspicious gland. Outcomes after surgery, it's got about a 99% success rate. Um, which results in increased bone density, resolution of the hypocalurea. Um, so they have a decreased risk of stones, but it's not entirely eliminated. Uh, the neurocognitive symptoms generally resolve and a pretty significant improvement in the functional ability for the elderly. And then uh, one other thing, bilateral explorations um, done under local anesthesia, which uh, was kind of cool to me. I, I've not participated in any of these large neck surgeries done under local anesthesia. It certainly seems possible. Uh, but I also see a whole lot of problems with it. Uh, from my standpoint, one of the concerns would be that I've got an unsecure airway with a patient having a neck surgery. But it depends on your, uh, you know, your surgeon and their capabilities. Um, and you being familiar with that is one of the biggest parts. You'll see there's a lot of regional variations from one center to the next and kind of comfort levels for uh, surgeons, techniques. Uh, I think as we continue to expand our use of uh, regional anesthesia, we may see more and more of these large neck surgeries that are done this way. Um, I think it's certainly beneficial for the patient, but uh, we're not there yet. So we'll see where we get, but uh, this is definitely something for you to keep considering um, as we move on. I uh, appreciate your time. If you have any questions, please let me know. I'm more than happy to follow up with anything. Thank you very much.